what's going on everybody this is john j gaming on the mic here coming at you with our very first rebuild here on ea college football 2025 now you guys have seen from the thumbnail and the title of this video i had a little bit of help my beautiful wife told me that I should build Old Dominion, and you know what they say for the married men out there, happy wife, happy wife. So we're going to go ahead and try to build Old Dominion over the course of the next five seasons, but we're going to have a couple of caveats, and we're going to have a couple of challenges that I want to try and accomplish while I'm here at Old Dominion. First and foremost, the limitations that I am going to put on myself, while I'm not going to recruit my, uh, limit myself in recruiting, because the game is going to do that on its own is actually going to be very realistic compared to what we see in the past with NCAA 14 for example what I am going to do in terms of the games I'm not going to jump into a game at least not every single one of those games what I am going to do is if I'm going to jump into a game under two circumstances if it is a nationally televised matchup within EA college football or it's a top 25 matchup between me and another team that's also ranked in the top 25 and it'll also be relegated to just playing in the moments as well another thing that i want to talk real quick is the challenges that we'll have in terms of goals that i want to accomplish i definitely want to win the sun belt at least once and i also want to try and secure a college football playoff berth at some point over the next five seasons we got five years to do it let's see if we can go ahead and accomplish that but first, let's take a quick look to see what kind of schedule we're going to work with, as well as what kind of pitches are we going to start out here starting this rebuild. So as you can see, we are going to be a one-star school to start things out, which means we are going to have a little bit of work to do if we want to make our way up to the top of college football. Starting with our year one schedule, this is actually the schedule for Old Dominion this upcoming season. And we do have a couple of power conference opponents. We start the season taking on South Carolina on the road. And we also take Virginia Tech at home before we round out with Eastern Carolina and Bowling Green to round out the season. With that being said, though, we then jump into our Sun Belt schedule. And what's unique about the Sun Belt Conference, they're the, actually the only conference in the FBS level that actually does have a legitimate and I mean a legitimate chance to have divisions. They're the only school in the country that has that. And then, of course, we have the Army-Navy game at the very end. That's a standalone week. For the rest of us, it is considered a bye week. So that's going to be our schedule going into year number one. And then, of course, this is the pitches that we're going to work with. Now, we are going to have great pitches to work with. We, are, for example, are going to really struggle with championship contender, program tradition, brand exposure. So our NIL game is not going to be very high. We do have a couple of things that we can work through with, though. And I chose a, um, I did end up picking an existing coach to kind of uh, play to the style of Old Dominion. Coach Prestige is going to be a good one. And then Coach Stability is going to be good for us as well. I do also have it set up to where we can't be fired. So hopefully Coach Stability is not going to be a big issue. Some of these other ones are going to have a struggle in terms of bringing in recruits on a given basis. So we do have to be measured in terms of how we go after guys. We also only have 450 hours for any given week. We're a smaller school, so we don't have much to budget. Therefore, we need to be strategic with how we spend those points on any given week. But let's go ahead and jump into our very first game that we have in this rebuild. And we're going on the road to take on South Carolina. You can already tell that this is going to be a rocking environment. And we're immediately going to show that it's going to be a rough time for us out here, man. As it, within the first 30 seconds of this game, we already allow a touchdown thrown behind us, man. Nice little slant pattern out there to make it 7-0 early. And then later on in the half, South Carolina trying to put together another drive right before going into halftime. They're able to pick up that first down right there before hitting the two-minute warning. Before finding the end zone the second time. And South Carolina 
immediately taking a little bit of a lead here we're already going to be down by a couple of possessions so we got a two minute drive here gonna try to see if we can answer back but we throw an interception and this gets taken all the way back to the crib Jalen kilgore gonna get to the end zone and we're down 24 to 3 already just having a difficult time getting much of anything going well, let's see if we can find some semblance of an offense here first and 10 as we go with a five line set wilson drops back wants to throw over the middle but we throw it late we throw it late and we also had x open didn't even see him and that is going to cost us dramatically as we will lose our first game in this rebuild 38 to 10 we weren't expected to win this game, but the fact that we got blown out like this shows that we certainly have a long way to go. We want to compete with the big boys in college football. But things would not get much better for us in our first home game of the season as we did host Eastern Carolina. We end up dropping that game too. We end up losing 37 to 19. We were hanging with this Eastern Carolina team for most of this game actually, but in that fourth quarter, we just let it go and it certainly didn't help though we ran for less than two yards a carry. Gotta be a little bit more balanced on offense. We gotta build a program that's gonna be built in that kind of direction. But there is certainly going to be no rest for the wicked though as we get to be at our home stadium for the very first time on the beaches of Virginia and we have a big time team coming to our campus for our first home game of the season as Virginia Tech comes into town here at SB Ballard Stadium and let's see if we can pull off a big time upset here hopefully being at home will help us out tremendously because with the type of team that we have you know getting off to a slow start like we did gave us a really hard time honestly so let's see if we can get to this hot start and so far we're doing all right late in the first quarter we're still tied with nobody scoring yet but then we set up the speed option over to the left hand side and we get our first meaningful touchdown in gameplay in this rebuild we're gonna pull ourselves up seven to nothing with Devin Roche able to find the end zone for us here however Virginia Tech will work to respond and they will do so with ease as Virginia Tech will find the end zone touchdown Hokies and Tutton is going to find the end zone there as well in order to tie things up and it remains a close game throughout as we go ahead and see what we can do here with a chance to take the lead third and four we get a throw to the outside beautiful release and we find the end zone touchdown Monarchs and yes sir baby we're able to find that end zone we got the lead against a premier ACC squad so up by seven here with a chance to extend the lead further as that was a dot oh my goodness Kyron Drones feeling himself on this particular drive we know he was going to be a hard quarterback to stop going in and we saw it there on that particular drive as well that's going to be a touchdown for Virginia Tech there and we're going to be all knotted up here at 17 apiece but late in the third quarter with a chance to hold on to the lead trying to get to the left hand side how, I don't know how we didn't break that pass up the coverage was was all right there until the very end and that was going to haunt us as Virginia Tech was going to be able to put together yet another drive and they're able to find the end zone once again so we find ourselves down by 10 at this point as we got to go to our quarterback here with the quarterback power and the power draw works for us there we're able to find the touchdown at that particular instance but we gotta go for this onside kick we can't recover this we're gonna be cooked and we're gonna fall to zero and three on the season and that onside kick recovery just didn't have enough bounces to it now with that said even though we did not find a way to win we had some bright spots in this game though grant wilson played well 216 two touchdowns no interceptions and then our freshman running back devin roche he had nearly 100 yards on the ground able to get a touchdown with grant wilson and we found a, the end zone with our senior tailback young as well
For the receivers, we had Isaiah Page, you know, end up going over 100 yards. I think the biggest thing that we got to work on is just consistency defensively. Gave up quite a few big plays, at least bigger plays in this game. But we're able to clutch up in the red zone a good portion of the time. It's clearly, it's still an area of focus because we definitely got burnt in this game pretty consistently. So after that tough loss that we had against virginia tech we did end up going ahead and simming a few games now i actually didn't think this bowling green game was going to be a nationally televised matchup but hey i'm here for it we still found a way to win even though i didn't step in we're also doing okay in sunbelt play here playing a very close game against coastal carolina but then going out there and really putting a goose egg on georgia state winning 36 to nothing our most dominant win of the season and that is going to take us to Texas State, a nationally televised game. And we also have multiple people coming in for a visit as well. We're still looking for our first commit, still trying to get a, a handle on how recruiting is, is going to work. But I think this is a winnable game. I mean, Texas State is not that much better than us. And we're going to be at home. So let's go ahead and jump in here and see if we can actually go out here and get it done. So our first meaningful game here in year number one. Let's see if we can make something shake here. That's a nice uh, juke there by Devin Roche. Devin Roche able to pay on the first down, but it looks like one of our offensive linemen did end up getting shaken up there a little bit. So hopefully he's all right as we try to take a deep shot down the field, and that was ill-advised trying to go on a triple team. And I think we're learning quickly. Oh, wait a minute. Ball's on the ground. Oh, oh, if we only got away from that one person, we could have taken that to the crib. So we pick up the first down, but not in traditional means. Looks like our quarterback did get shaken up, though, as we try to throw short over to the left-hand side. Able to get a couple of blocks before getting out of bounds and picking up the first down there. So we're putting together a little bit of a drive as we are offered that second chance. That's a nasty little juke move again by Roche. Certified lover boys, certified baller as we try to find the end zone there, but we did it again. We threw another interception. And quick we were realizing that NCAA 14 Heisman and, and this college football Heisman mode, it's, it's a different feeling. But you know what? Got to give credit to the defense. They're playing extremely hard. We're able to get a fumble recovery there towards the end of the first quarter. But how long can our defense hold? Eventually, the dam was going to burst. And with less than two minutes left to play here in the first half, that dam was going to burst on this particular run, doing a little bit of a jet pass, which is a nice little play that I've been enjoying uh, like in this, uh, this college football game. But we're down 14 to nothing. And we're just struggling tremendously. We are having a tremendously hard time really getting much of anything going. And that was a microcosm of this game for sure. We lose 34-6 to as we get a little dose of reality that not only does our team have to get better, I have to be a lot better if we want to do anything in this rebuild. The good news for our guys is that we do end up finding a way to bounce back as we do end up beating Georgia Southern 28 to 24. But now we get into another critical Sun Belt game as we now have to travel to Boone, North Carolina in order to take on this Appalachian State team. And this Appalachian State team, they're not ranked, but they are a team that's pretty darn good here at the same time. So we're going to have our work cut out for us. We have to play significantly better than what we saw in the Texas State game previously. Let's see if we can bounce back and finally get our first win in gameplay. So if we want to have any chance of rallying back here in year number one to get to the Sun Belt Championship game or at the very minimum make it to a bowl game, gotta find a way to pull this upset off against Appalachian State but we put ourselves in a tough position from the get-go as the Mountaineers are able to find the end zone and they quickly take control of this game already down 14 to 3 but we get a play from our defense picked off in the red zone and that was exactly what we needed if we wanted to try and rally back and possibly save our season here in year number one that was a beautiful interception 
And we're going to try to seize momentum here. Down 14 to free, but we try to throw it away because I was feeling pressure. And unfortunately, our quarterback, the ball just slips out of his hand. And that is going to be taken to the crib unless one's got something to say about it. We get a stop at the one yard line. So great effort there to stop the scoop and score. But still inside the five yard line, it was not going to take very long for this explosive Mountaineers offense to get going here into the end zone. And we're finding that out real quickly as Appalachian State, they are going to go on and win big here as well. We lose 45 to 10 in what was our last gasp of air for Sunbelt contention. We'll just have to wait and see if we can do anything to save our season and possibly get a bull bid. So for us, we end up simulating the rest of the games that we had because after that loss to App State, we were effectively out of the Sun Belt title race. So this is what the last three games went down for. We lose James Madison, but that was a really close game. That could have really swung either way. We do end up winning our senior day against Marshall, but then we close out our season, losing to Arkansas State, and the Red Wolves were able to go ahead and they were able to win in their sixth game of the season. So Arkansas State does get bowl eligibility up against us. Now, this was also an opportunity for us to go ahead and maybe make some changes to the staff. Don't like what we got going on in terms of both our offensive and defensive coordinators. So what I am going to do is I am going to fire both of my coordinators and see if we can do anything better than that. As for how things went overall this season, this was a difficult year. I think, you know, trying to get used to the playbook for Old Dominion uh, did really play into it. Uh, Grant Wilson only threw for 12 touchdowns and 11 interceptions, but we still have him back for his senior season. The backup, Colton Joseph, he had his moments as well, but four touchdowns and five interceptions just isn't going to do it either. We did see a little bit of J.P. Sangold as well. On the ground was not much better, although Aaron Young was our leading rusher. He ends up going for about 500 yards on the ground and six touchdowns. Uh, the only one that had more than one touchdown on the year was Devin Roche, who ended up with four. Receivers, now we did have a couple of nice receivers here. Miles Austin, Austin was one of them. Had nearly 1,000 yards receiving. He was a nice player for Old Dominion here. And it plays higher than that 74. Other player of note here was Kelby Williams, who had 53 catches, 711 yards, and three touchdowns out of Houston, Texas. Finally, Deontay Vines, the senior out of Connecticut, did have three touchdown grabs as well. Now, where we really struggled was our offensive line. I think we truly did struggle here, but our biggest culprit was Santana Saunders. Saunders allowed 10 sacks, which did lead the team. Although the rest of the offensive line really did not have too much to write home about either. Defensively, our leading tackler was EJ Green. EJ Green was able to lead the team with 58 tackles. We did have a couple guys with more than five sacks in Jason and Henderson who could be moving on to the NFL. Denzel Lowry has a shot of maybe making something happen with NFL aspirations as well. EJ Green also was the leader in terms of interceptions. EJ Greener did have three interceptions, which led the team, followed by Rashad Reason, who had a couple himself. Finally, with forced fumbles, Rashad Reason led the team in forced fumbles, while leading in fumble recoveries, and a two-way tie between the sophomore Patrick Smith Young and Koa Nautala, the sophomore red shirt out of Newport News, Virginia. Now, this was a real interesting one. We actually saw a wide receiver win the Heisman Trophy. Tatua McMillan, the junior out of Arizona, posted up 1,200 yards, but found the end zone on 16 separate occasions throughout the season. An interesting Heisman Trophy pick, but definitely well-deserved. As for who we ended up hiring in terms of who would our coaches be, we got a couple of coordinators that I think are going to really help our program tremendously. 
Elliot Bennett is going to be a master motivator. He is a spread offense type of guy, and he does have the Central Florida pipeline. So that could be helpful in recruiting the East Coast. And then, oh, I just went ahead and turned backwards. But for the defensive coordinator, for the defensive coordinator for our team, we found an elite recruiter in Casey Steffen. His pipeline is Tidewater, so maybe that means like it's a little bit more of that Gulf Coast, like maybe Southern Alabama, that type of region. Not sure what that time, Tidewater pipeline is referring to, but I do love that he is considered a master mode, uh, recruiter, though. That's going to help us out tremendously on the recruiting tail, as we are still trying to figure out how we want to go about handling recruiting. Now, because we did make some adjustments to our um our coaching staff that does cause us to actually have some people enter the transfer portal now for most of these guys i really could care less if they actually do hit the transfer portal. But there's a couple guys i would like to keep around amori uh, morrison and bryce duke are two guys that i definitely want to try and persuade uh we did get morrison to stay we'll see if we can get the same thing for duke no bryce duke is gonna enter the transfer portal i do have three more uh persuasions that we can try to use and i'm gonna just try to go after these true freshmen uh because i think they do have more upside than what we have going on with you know some of the other players that are entering a transfer portal and while we managed to get a couple of them to stay most notably amori morrison we do have a few people that are actually going to leave us uh bryce duke uh is gonna leave the transfer portal and then we're also going to have uh heineken uh isles crutchville and grant enter transfer portal as well so we are losing a few guys but hopefully that means we can be more, a little bit more aggressive in the transfer portal ourselves now for the very first time actually trying to do recruiting we did okay actually for a one-star school we end up signing the 77th overall class in college football and we end up signing 22 total players now some of these players did end up coming from the transfer portal uh, for example Lucas Simmons came from the transfer portal and he was actually our top signee he actually is a low you know actually like closer to a four star than a three star uh, based on his overall rating we do also sign Taven French who is actually a gem of an athlete so he actually is going to be a four star caliber player Cortwin Sauer is a three star Richard Ferguson is also a three star and then we also sign uh Quincy Howard as well alongside guys like Jamal Mingo Terrence Stingy Jalen Page uh Vonde Ruffin and you know just uh, just a bunch of other guys you know we we end up getting most of our needs we did okay for still learning the recruiting mechanics you know it's just gonna it's gonna be a learning curve but it does feel more realistic seeing that we were a one-star program so this is kind of the level of class that we are expected to sign we're nowhere near this top 25 but if you look within the Sun Belt we actually did pretty well within the Sun Belt we signed the third best class in the conference so while we're uh we could have recruited better at a national level we are recruiting one of the better classes and hopefully that helps us trend upward to that ultimate goal of trying to go to the Sun Belt Championship. Now what we did also do is that we also ended up finding a coaching upgrade so we are now a level 25. I know I'm going to need a quarterback next season for season number two so I think I'm going to use it on this upsell perk that's going to give me a much larger impact on quarterbacks moving forward so we do end up getting a touch better as we are going to be roughly a 79 overall team which is in line with me and the other Sun Belt teams within our conference some of the notable guys that we have are Denzel Lowry Kelby Williams Ryan Ramsey but then the player that I'm most excited about is Devin Roche really looking forward to seeing what he can do uh, with the team uh, although we do need to get that coach prestige up in order to keep him from entering that transfer portal he is one of our better players I do however end up uh, going ahead and looking for four players I'm going to need to encourage to enter the transfer portal so we're just going to go and work from the bottom that freshman red shirt was a 50 something overall he wasn't going to see the field and I don't know how I feel about this 60 overall guy either. We're going to let him go as well. Really hoping that I can sign a better class. We did 
really focus in on the recruiting or not the recruiting but the scouting aspect like I necessarily wanted to just because well we uh we just didn't have the points for it in my opinion this year we're gonna be a one and a half star program so we will have more points to our disposal but not as much I think what I'm gonna do is since I think I got rid of the left tackle already I think we're gonna get rid of this halfback and George Fournette who's gonna be encouraged then to transfer portal as well and that should bring us down to our 85 guys for the upcoming season so this is what year number two has entailed for us here we're gonna open the season up against indiana and then we're gonna have an early sunbelt game against marshall to start conference play after that we're gonna continue our home and home with virginia tech virginia tech this time we're going on the road to face them but then we're also taking on north carolina state as well and a pretty good Liberty team as well, who ended up going 10-4 last year. The rest of our Sun Belt schedule does follow it as such. The only elite team from our Sun Belt that we have is Appalachian State. But many of these other games I see as winnable. Let's see here in year number two if we can actually make a bowl game this time around. So we open our season up versus this Hoosier squad, and let's see if we can learn from our past mistakes as Wilson's just going to step up. He's got some running room, and Wilson's going to find the end zone. Touchdown, Monarchs. Let's go, baby. Fun in the end zone here in Indiana, and we already have a 7-0 lead on this Hoosiers team. Meanwhile, here with about midway through this first quarter, Roche is going to get a nice little run there, pick up a first down, and then on a third and short, Wilson's going to get the pitch out over to right-hand side. He's got speed to burn, gets away from some defenders. He's looking back, but ain't nobody going to catch him, baby. Touchdown, Devin Roche. Let's roll, baby. Oh, we are looking good to start things out here. Look how much an offseason can do for us for sure, man. But we put the ball on the ground later on in the half. We really tried to find a way to give this game up after we started off dominating. But with that being said, we were able to clutch up there in the second half. Able to actually win comfortably. And we are going to win 21-10. to Jerome Carter gets named player of the game on our team. Now, it certainly wasn't the prettiest day for our quarterback as he did decide to keep it on the ground more often, but he was efficient though, 10 for 12, 128 yards, touchdown, did throw an interception. But the vocal point today was that sophomore tailback, Devin Roche. Devin Roche was electric in this one, 127 and a touchdown there. And while we couldn't throw the ball very often, we did have early Newsome, a true sophomore from Washington, Delaware, really shine here two catches in 62 yards even have a receiving touchdown in this particular game and of course your player of the game ends up being the freshman jerome carter jerome carter a 79 overall freshman he had two interceptions in this game and he really showed that he could be a menace here in college football moving forward so you would think after beating Indiana, we would be feeling pretty good about ourselves. We should be able to handle Marshall, but that's not what happened here at all. We actually lose our next game to Marshall, 34 to 17. However, this Virginia Tech squad is reeling themselves. They're gonna be 0-2 going into this matchup. We're on national television, so let's see if we can avenge ourselves from that close loss that we took against them last season. So let's see if we can get our get back against Virginia Tech as they'll throw over the middle here. And that's going to go for a nice first down as the Hokies are trying to get a nice little drive going here. Let's see if we can keep them out of the end zone though. And we give up too much space. I was expecting uh, like an inward route. Probably should have been a little bit tighter. That one's on me. And quickly, we are losing control of this ball game as we quickly find ourselves down 17 to nothing on the road against this Virginia Tech squad. Now, down 24 to nothing here late in the third quarter. We get a nice little run for Roche, trying to get inside the five-yard line, and he gets it! Roche finds the end zone! Touchdown, Monarchs! And we're not done yet. We're not going to quit like this Season 1 team previously did. We are going to fight to the very end, and let's see if we can make things shake out here with three minutes left to play in this ball game 
As now we got a second and long coming up here, facing some pressure, and Wilson's going to escape the pocket. He's going to slide down and gets across midfield. As now less than two and a half left to go, trying to run some speed option here. Actually going to keep it with quarterback. He's got some wheels on him and gets to the first down marker, but he forgot about the football, though. We had to hold on to that football. We did not do it. And yeah, this is going to be a tough pill to swallow for us here. We lose to our in-state opponent in Virginia Tech once again. And we lose by double digits. So not nearly as close as was it was last time around. Kyron Jones went crazy on us. So I don't know how we found a way to pull this off. But after getting absolutely embarrassed on the road against Virginia Tech... We were able to beat NC State in simulation. I don't know how we pulled this off. I just simmed ahead because I assume this is going to be a big fat L. But that was not the case. So with that being said, we now get into more of our conference action. We are going to be taking on a ranked Liberty squad where a big win here at home could really help our chances in getting to the Sun Belt Championship game. So here we are with our first uh, top 25 matchup of the season and we got a unique little score here of three to two as Liberty was able to get a safety back in the first quarter hopefully we can hold on to that lead but our our corner gets broken down like a Kendrick Lamar diss track and that will eventually lead to a Liberty touchdown the, f the flames of Liberty are burning bright as we have our uh, our theme stadium with the blue and white out here today but we're not looking good in front of our home crowd as, as at all as we're gonna give up a broken tackle and we lose on the edge trying to get him before he gets into the end zone but we can't take the right angle and we immediately find ourselves between a rock and a hard place at the present moment gonna be only up down by another six points we get down by 13 so we need some points on this drive and we throw yet another interception it's just a bad habit from ncaa 14 that honestly i gotta shake out before it's all said and done um because i mean we can't have this many mistakes in games you know we are actively hurting our team but this will not hurt our team at all though huge play down the sideline as Grant Wilson finally able to get to that 100-yard mark. And that is going to put Grant Wilson over 1,000 passing yards on the season. He is having a solid campaign for us. Let's see if we can finish this drive off with a touchdown. And we will end up finding the end zone. That's a touchdown for your Monarchs. As we'll get ourselves slowly but surely back into this game. At least carry a little bit of momentum before going into halftime. But we got to get a stop on defense. So I read this perfectly. And this right here was a mistake. I probably shouldn't have taken this out. But we ended up doing it anyways. Vigley didn't kill us from a scoreboard perspective. So we keep it to a two-score game. And that was important because we got the ball to start the second half. And we use it to find the end zone with Devin Roche there again. That's a touchdown for your Monarchs. And we're only going to be down by 10. Now, with a minute left here, this is a critical time in the game. But we get to it out to our speedy receiver on the perimeter who finds the end zone. We're back in it, folks. Only down by a field goal. But it comes down to this onside kick again. Let's see if we can get this onside kick here. As the kick is now on the ground. But it's going to be picked up one-handed there. And that means that we are going to be cooked. We end up losing this game in a close one, 26 to 23. I love how we fought. You know, and we're getting to a point where, you know, for the most part, um, either we gone from losing big to now we're losing small. So we're making progress in the right direction. I am getting a little bit more used to the highest bit difficulty on this game. Hopefully we're on the up and up from here. But even though we didn't come out on top, we had some good performances across the board. Grant Wilson looked good in this one, 20 for 26, 244. Touchdown and that early interception, but he did settle himself down quite a bit. Devin Roche was also able to find the end zone on multiple different occasions, which was really cool to see. Uh, we did have a touchdown from Dominique Dunnan, the senior 
out of Virginia as well. Really, the difference in this game was kicking. You know, if we would have just made our field goals, we would have been winners today. But unfortunately, that was not the case here. Bad kicking, basically user error. That's on me. But it's a tough way to go down, knowing that if we just had competent kicking in this particular game, we will have been able to pull off quite the upset. So after that, a heartbreaking loss to Liberty, which Liberty actually is now a top 15 team in the nation, we do go on a little bit of a run here. We got wins against Georgia Southern, we dominate James Madison, but an Appalachian State team that has struggled mightily at just 2-6, and six, they are going to beat us at home. So that's a tough pill to swallow for us. That being said, though, we are looking at an opportunity to possibly get back into the Sun Belt Championship race. We do have a must win against Arkansas State, which we are going to go ahead and jump right into. So let's jump into this key Sun Belt game here as we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Trying to throw the short hitch route, but we throw yet another interception. Not the first drive that we wanted to have in this game, but that's the one that we dealt with. So now we need our defense to come out here, make a play for us. But that is not going to happen though as we give up a touchdown down the sideline and kind of a nightmare start for us as we immediately find ourselves down seven and nothing, not what we wanted. So later on in the first quarter, Arkansas State trying to put together yet another drive as this tailback makes a couple of guys miss actually as that will bring the Red Wolves into the red zone where we try to regather our thoughts. First and 10 for Arkansas State. Down over on the on the left hand side. They're going to throw a little bit of an RPO and this man is wide but naked open into the end zone. Touchdown Red Wolves in Arkansas State is going to find itself down 14 to nothing. And we are in some serious trouble here, guys. We got to find a way to rally back, and we got to do it quickly. Tyreek Sims is going to at least help us out with that particular run. And the speed option later on in the drive will help us get back into this game a little bit more as we certainly show that we don't have that quit in us. And Arkansas State, honestly, they are one of the better teams in the Sun Belt here in year number two. But yeah, man, 31 to 17, gonna be your score. We do get another touchdown, so we have a chance to actually tie this game up and possibly go into overtime. But it's real critical that we keep ourselves in the moment. Wilson gonna drop back on a play action, gonna try to throw over the middle, but threw it too early. Would have, should have let him get past the safety before letting that go. But the pressure forced us to. Get that ball out sooner than we wanted. And yeah, we continue to really hurt ourselves here. You know, late early game, late game situation. And yeah, man, this looks like it's going to be barbecue chicken for us here again. So it's a close one here once more. But with that being said, we still find a way to lose this game against one of the better teams in the Sun Belt. We played better than we did in year one overall but we're still making those critical mistakes towards the end of the game, and that was the difference in this one as well. So it was another game in which we were competitive. However, that being said, we fall short once more in a key matchup. Grant Wilson really struggled with today's game. You know, felt like he had to press too much through four interceptions that certainly ended up being costly for us. However, the backup tailback Tyreek Sims did step in with the injury uh, to our starter. And he was okay today. 62 yards and a touchdown there. Receiving wise, we had Kelby Williams go absolutely crazy. The Houston Tanks' product did end up going 157 for two touchdowns. He was a bright spot in the loss. But defensively, we truly struggled as only Steven Scott had more than three tackles on the day. Four solo tackles in today's ball game. Don't think we had any turnovers either. So losing that turnover battle certainly hurt us as well. And it looks like once again, we're going to fall short of that dream of going to the Sun Belt Championship. So we'll go ahead and sim the rest of the season. 
All right, boys, so we did make it into a bowl game, actually. We actually finished the year six and six, and because we were bowl eligible, we're gonna go to the Cure Bowl to take on the Akron Zips on a neutral side field. So let's see if we can finish this season not only with a winning record, but a bowl win on this rebuild as we get to the start end of year number two here. First drive of the game, we're starting off pretty well and just, just going to that ground game. And I think that's just something that we need to do moving forward is, you know, while we're still trying to get used to the speed of this game and with this Heisman difficulty, we just got to establish that run. If we can establish the run and keep ourselves in situations to where we have to throw the ball so much, I think we'll be fine as a team. And that's exactly what we do here. We're, we're already tied here at seven apiece, but Akron had all the time in the world as we did not get any penetration there whatsoever. Kind of like an insole. And now it's going to be third and long, but in the red zone, no. Akron trying to throw over to the right hand side, but it's intercepted. Harris is going to try to take this all the way. And ain't nobody going to be touching this man. Touchdown, Monarchs. Keandre Harris taking it 78 yards to the crib and that's our defense coming out and making a massive play and that will give us the lead here in the cure bowl a chance though to make it 21 to 7 he's trying to throw to the left hand side we got a little bit stuck there and so we had a chance to make it a two score game early in the second half couldn't quite do it and now we're hanging on for dear life 21 to 14 your score as we try to throw it short there as well and we might throw ourselves a pick six too this is what i was talking about getting used to mechanics of ea college football and just making genuinely bad decisions and jarman makes us pay for it as well that pick six is going to allow akron to tie it up here as we get into those final moments of this game we do get a drive, and this time we actually don't turn the ball over. We just got to, like, lock in on the kicking. Because as you guys may know, kicking is a little bit more difficult in this game than it is in EA College football, uh, than it is in NCAA 14. We kick it right before the end of the two-minute warning. Get it through, and we will have a three-point lead. But we got to get a stop on defense, and we thought we had the stop on a fourth and six. But a diving grab was simply not enough. And now it's third and five, a chance to ice the game, and we get it with our, our defensive lineman. Oh my goodness, we got an interception with a D lineman. Let's go. We are so back. We are so freaking back, man. And that should be enough for us to ice this game. Third and 23, though. And they're looking like they're trying to uh, post up on us here. Let's see if we can get a little go pattern here to end this game, end this thing in style. Yeah, that should do it here as we are. Yo, they sent the blitz out. We're going to make them pay for it with a deep ball. Cut! Broken tackle. And we're just going to try to run out as much clock as possible. Breaking some tackles there. And then we'll just run it in after that. That's how you finish a Cure Bowl. We're going to be Cure Bowl champions. And we're going to finish this season above 500 as well. Now, Grant Wilson in his final college game wasn't the most sharp. He did throw two interceptions. But he did also throw that touchdown pass that was ultimately able to allow us the opportunity to close this game out. And a big reason for that as well is we were able to get that ground game going. Makari James got the majority of the carries today. But Tyreek Sims, our backup tailback, he was the one that did the most work. Especially on that first drive of the game, getting that opening drive touchdown. Meanwhile, Kelby Williams is going to come out as a winner of the Cure Bowl. And he had a career day. Nine catches for 191 yards and a touchdown. He was unguardable. And then defensively, our team did just enough defensively in order to come out on top. And a big reason for that was... We really had some turnovers today. Ke Keandre Harris had two turnovers. Jerome Carter had a turnover, as did Langston Williams and Steven Scott as well. Some certified ballers on this team, and they certainly went out there and put it all on this for this Old Dominion squad. Call of these guys, we're going to get back next season, or at least that's what I'm hoping for.
Now, before I kind of jump into the end of season recap to see how guys did in year number two, I want to point out that NC State is playing Charlotte in the national championship game. I thought it was funny to see Charlotte in here. They got in as a 12 seed. NC State, a team that we did beat, make it to the national championship game. So that's something that we can certainly hang our hats on here as we gear up for a year number three. Now, Grant Wilson was better this year. Uh, but we are going to see the backup quarterback Holden Joseph next year who didn't get a single snap this year. So I'm really interested to see how that's going to turn out. Hopefully we'll be okay. Hopefully it's not going to be a uh, bad news for us by any means. Uh, we did have 25 touchdowns and 18 interceptions. Most of those I probably threw. Devin Roche could be going into the transfer portal. And if that's the case, that could be a massive loss for us. He was a big part of our offense, even though he was hurt for most of the year. 347 yards and seven touchdowns. While Tyreek Sims wasn't too bad himself. He had five touchdowns on the ground as well. And then Grant Wilson was able to chip in three touchdowns too. Now for the receivers, Miles Austin actually did hit a thousand yards in his final season and had nine touchdowns too. Kelby Williams was actually very close as well. He had that big day in the Cure Bowl. Unfortunately, he's going to fall just shy of 1,000 yards, but seven touchdowns isn't too bad either. Dominic Dunn was pretty good too, especially in the red zone, surprisingly. He ended up with five, 54 catches, 618 yards, and two touchdowns. Now for the defense real fast, Jamez Drummer did lead the team in tackles. He had 74 total tackles on the season as a senior. He did uh, also had some help from fellow senior Denzel Lowry, who finished with eight and a half sacks this year. Only Amari Morrison finished with more sacks, definitely losing some production on that defensive line. We're going to have to figure out how to replace this production for sure. Now, that being said, Keandre Harris led the team in interceptions this season. He'll be graduating with five total interceptions. Ryan Ramey had a good year with three picks, as did the freshman redshirt Jerome Carter. Jerome Carter was able to get in as a 79 overall and made an immediate impact for our team. Finally, for first fumbles, Jerome Carter was tied with sophomore Steven Scott, who we're going to try to uh, help not get into the transfer portal, I hope. They both had two forced fumbles on the season. Now, with that being said, because we actually saw our coach upgrade it up to a uh, B minus, we were able to uh, get most people to get out of the transfer portal. So our roster is going to stay together. Granted, we are going to lose quite a bit of production. So we're going to have to figure that out for sure. One person entered the transfer portal that I'm really bummed around, and that is Lucas Simmons. Lucas Simmons was someone that we got in the transfer portal portal last year but his playing style is not enough we'll see if we can persuade him to stay and he will not be persuaded so for the second time in his college career Lucas Simmons as a sophomore red shirt is going to enter the transfer portal once again however that being said going into next season we do end up keeping most of our team that was planning on coming back together and we could certainly implement some changes our end as well now we do end up getting ourselves together here for the recruiting season and we actually do a better job recruiting than last time around first of all not only do we end up signing a class that's in the top half of the country we do sign a top 65 class we also happen to sign the best class in our conference Last year, we had a top five class as well. So hopefully that means we continue to work our way up. Loving that we are continuing to work on building this program. And I think we're really starting to get a handle of recruiting. Biggest note here is we did bring in Luddy, who is a quarterback from UAB. He transfers into our program. He was a free star in the transfer portal. And we were able to snag him in terms of that promise of getting him some playing time. So we go through training results as we get started with year number three, or at least getting ready for it, and we continue to get better. Our overall slightly increases up to an 81 overall, and that's in spite of all of the key players that we lost on this team. And overall, just feel like we have a younger group. I mean, we have some 
some more uh, like sophomores and juniors on this team was continuing to handle recruiting at a pretty reasonable level and I think in year number four we could have a pretty special football team in the Sun Belt but for right now let's just go ahead and see what this particular team can do here in year number three as we have more high caliber football players on the squad but before i can do that though we do have to encourage a few people to go ahead and just hit that transfer portal for me uh akeem out of bouquet a freshman red shirt out of little rock arkansas he's gonna have to get the boot because at 59 overall i just don't see a possibility of him actually getting onto the field and then i think what i'm also gonna do i'm gonna have this tight end go ahead and hit the transfer portal as well he's already a uh, sophomore but then it gets real interesting after that um i think i'm gonna get rid of this running back here because andre uh akuda akuda yeah andre akuda he doesn't have any physical or mental abilities and because of that we're gonna go ahead and have him hit the transfer portal as well as that is going to round out our top 85 going into year number three and in year number three, we're actually going to start the year off with a Sun Belt game. We're going to take on Georgia State to open the season up. And Georgia State coming off an 8-5 record themselves. So they're not a bad team by any means. Virginia Tech is ranked in the top 10. And then we'll get into an Eastern Carolina matchup as well before we get into the rest of conference playing. But a couple of notable games here in the middle of the season. UConn is in here as well. That's the first time we've seen them. But then making the trip up to Texas. Ranked number six in the country. They won 10 games last year. They're certainly going to be absolutely no joke going in to year number three. So a little bit more difficult of a strength of schedule than last time out. We do have two top 10 teams. So it's very important that all these other games, we got to take advantage if we want to improve off of our seven and six record that we were able to experience in the regular season so let's go ahead and start cooking here in year number three as we start things off on the road taking on georgia state now we actually have a significant overall difference and it's actually favoring us for a change but that doesn't mean that georgia state isn't going to be motivated to try to pull the upset off in our first week of the season because they start the season off with a touchdown down the sideline and we quickly find ourselves down seven to nothing however we regather ourselves we're a much more composed team than in season number one and we quickly find out just how good we can be when we lock in as old dominion's gonna score there we're gonna pick a 17 to 7 lead but georgia state will rally back and it's all tied up here in this second half we face a third and long as a team as we try to throw the curl pattern, but we throw it late and we get an interception. Fruit, we had him open. We absolutely did have him open there. The problem is we threw it late, and that's just the thing with those curl patterns. It's a timing thing, and it's not like an NCAA 14 where even on the Heisman, you have these massive windows. The windows are a lot smaller. You have to be more precise. And you have to be more timely. I think I'm finding this out the hard way. But with that being said, our team is so good that we are able to rally back from our mistake. And on the next drive, we correct ourselves with another touchdown on the ground with Murakai James. So we now officially have a lead. And we have a chance to close this game out as well. And we will with our tight end, who's going to drive us inside the 15-yard line. Now we can start running out some of his clock and start running our uh, two-minute two clock drill. And we actually run a successful option with Joseph. Joseph's going to find the end zone on the ground. Touchdown, Monarchs. And Old Dominion is going to come out of the season opener. And we still have a zero in our loss column. 31-24 is going to be your final score. Got some things that we need to work on, but I certainly see the potential of this football team moving forward, particularly with Marakai James. Now, Colton Joseph actually did end up winning that starting quarterback battle that we had in the spring, and he's going to be the future of our program. 
Always showed some flashes here and there. 178, a touchdown, and an interception. Did leave a little bit more to be desired, even though we did end up winning today. However, we always have a pretty nice backfield duo in Murakai James and Colton Joseph. Uh, those two were able to come through today and handle business, combining for free rushing touchdowns. As for the receivers, it's going to be more of an even spread this year as we don't have the same star power that we normally would have at this time of the year. That being said, Ricky Bromel caught his first passing touchdown of his college career. And then the defense was able to do just enough to come out on top. The junior corner, Jordan Holmes, was able to win the matchup overall. Going to be able to uh, get the uh, most solo tackles uh, on the team. Did not get any interceptions, it does seem like. And I don't think we forced any forced fumbles either. So while we didn't win the turnover battle, I am still happy that we got the win. So not only do we find a way to beat Georgia State, we find a way to beat Virginia Tech too. Simulated that game and hey, we might have something cooking here. Granted, Virginia Tech is struggling through this year. We beat them 35 to 30, beating that final score. And now we get to be at home for the very first time, taking on Eastern Carolina. I got quite a few people coming in and visiting. So you already know what time it is. I got to jump into this game. I want to see if we can, did I, meant, did I see that we were Hang on, let me, let me roll back here for a second. Did I just see where game of the week? Did I see that pop through? Oh, just game week. I thought, I was swear, I thought I saw our guys have a game of the week for whatever reason. Should be a pretty competitive game, but we are at home for the first time. Let's see if we can defend our home turf. So let's see if we can get off to a 3-0 start here as we take on Eastern Carolina. That's a good way to start it out as, hang on, we broke a tackle, and now we're in open space. This man is going to be gone like a girl in a country song. Touchdown, Monarchs. And Old Dominion is going to get it rolling with a 93-yard pick six. Oh, my goodness. You'll absolutely love to see it and we're already up seven to nothing later on in the half we get a big play downfield and that big play is going to set us up with our first red zone opportunity of the ball game we got to finish this drive off a couple of plays later we hand it off to murakai james and he is an absolute bowling ball able to get us down by the goal line but we try to finish the drive, and we will with a tight throw into the end zone. Touchdown, Monarchs. Lot is going to find the end zone, and he's going to go to the stands and celebrate with all of these fans that came out. This stadium's starting to fill up a whole lot more here now that we are actually starting to have some success as a program, and we have a chance to pull away here in the first half. Joseph is feeling himself, is continuing to find his receivers as that's going to get out of bounds. Uh, Joseph will now have 100 yards passing there. But a couple plays later, we get another dot over the middle. This is to uh, 39. Not sure who that guy was. Still trying to get used. That was actually Murakai James that actually threw that pass uh, or made that catch. But Corey Joseph's going to find the end zone for your Monarchs as we are going to get a touchdown there. Another score for Old Dominion. And we just never look back after that. We end up winning by a final score of 31 to nothing. We blank Eastern Carolina. And dare I say it, we might actually have some juice to have something special this season. So Colin Joseph had overall a better day, even though he was struggling to complete passes. He ends up going 215 for two touchdowns. Did throw an interception, but didn't make up for that by getting a touchdown on the ground. He had five carries for 13 yards on the ground, but Marikai James continues to be a workhorse for our team as we're still waiting for our starting tailback to get back from injury. He had a good day, even though he didn't find the end zone, averaging five yards a carry. Meanwhile, this time around, we see Ricky Bromel go out there and really have kind of one of those breakout days. Three catches, 109 yards, and a touchdown. He's playing higher than at 66 overall, which I absolutely love to see. 
we do have another touchdown that was caught by TJ Lott, who's one of these younger, less uh, proven players on the team. Love seeing these guys really coming out here and showing their worth. But what I was most impressed about today was our defense. Steven Scott led the way with four solo tackles. That's more than anybody on the team. But the play of the game has to go to Ryan Ramey, the senior corner out of Missouri City, Texas, able to take it 97 yards to the crib. And that was a tone setter for your Old Dominion Monarchs as we're now going to get out to 3-0 to start the season. And that dream season is going to continue for Old Dominion as we're now going to be 4-0 after a 31-13 victory against Coastal Carolina. So now we find ourselves in a rivalry game against James Madison with a chance to start the season off 5-0. And with more attention coming our direction, can we keep ourselves composed and focus on the task that's currently at hand? But even though we are out here uh, with an undefeated record and we have the better team than James Madison on paper, that being said, we can't take anybody for granted. We are starting off very slowly there as we end up turning the ball over on one of the first possessions of this game. We put the ball on the ground. So James Madison does capitalize on our mistakes. We find ourselves down three to nothing. But we just know how to run this football, man. We've really got running down to a T here at Old Dominion. And that's going to continue as Murakai Jones gets to the sideline, gets inside the five-yard line. And now we got to call a good play here on first and goal. Looking to go ahead and try to set up the read option here. As we go ahead and move the tight end into motion. Joseph's going to keep it. He has just enough of a crease. And he finds the end zone. Touchdown, Old Dominion. And the Monarchs are going to take the lead late in the first quarter. And you know we're having a good time when the white quarterback is trying to do the gritty. Almost like uh, got that Max Jones gritty to him. Uh, got, got something special there for sure. That was a special throw on the other hand. That was an actual dot there. I can't even be mad about it. It eventually turns into a James Madison touchdown the other way. <clears throat> kind of feels like even though this is a rivalry game, we kind of are sleepwalking through. And now James Madison actually does have a legitimate shot to try and find the end zone and possibly take the lead late. As now, second and 10, they throw over to the left-hand side. And this is going to be caught for a touchdown as neither of our defenders are able to make the tackle. Not the worst thing in the world because we just get the ball with more time, but with one timeout and 33 seconds left, it's not looking good. This could help us out here a little bit, though. We are able to go ahead. We got that play to, uh, to pick up the first down, but we only have a few more shots at the end zone, though. As Joseph, again, is going to scramble for a split second. He's got somebody open downfield. Nobody guarding him. <clears throat> and breaking that tackle was so big for us because we're able to get out of bounds. And it sets us up with one last opportunity to try and make something shake here. So let's see what we can do here on this all go. As we get to the line of scrimmage, got to find the end zone or it's over. Losing our first game of the season in an upset would be tough for us to see. But we find an open man and that might be George Aragon with the game winning touchdown in the final seconds of this game. So we put together a beautiful final drive. And we are still going to remain undefeated. Five games into this season. And we have still not lost yet. So we could really put ourselves in a spot to, hey, what if we go, go the distance? Could we make the playoff here in year number three? I think we might have a team that's capable of doing just that. All right, so that was a lot closer than I anticipated. But we still found a way to get the win in this particular matchup i mean how about that drive by colton joseph just really staying composed even though i mean i was freaking out internally i'm shocked that we found a way to win this one but colton joseph had the game winning touchdown and threw for 214 yards and two touchdowns meanwhile on the ground we had a similar level of effectiveness from markai james 
Lamar Guy James was able to run for over 100 yards, but didn't find the end zone yet again, and even fumbled the ball. Colin Joseph was also able to get a rushing touchdown on the ground as well. Now, for our receiving group, this was a very even day. No one had a particularly big matchup. Riga Bramell made that big catch in order to set us up with the opportunity to find the end zone on the next play where Matt Iverson was actually able to win that game winning touchdown. Now if we were to lose this game it was not going to be our defense's fault. Defense did what they needed to do with the exception of the last couple of drives. Ryan Ramey played pretty well though, led the team in solo tackles, had 8 total tackles on the day. We did not force any turnovers, so we actually did lose the turnover battle. But with that said, we handled our business. It was a little bit closer than I wanted it to be, but we're still undefeated. But then after our emotional victory against James Madison, we actually do drop a couple of head scratchers. We lose to Louisiana, and that was the Great and Cajun's first conference win of Sunbelt action. We also end up losing a close one to Appalachian State, which was a much bigger deal because they move ahead of us in that race for the Sunbelt title game. We do, however, bounce back and beat UConn. 35 to 14 which does now put our record at 6 and 2 going to this final month of the season and I definitely wanted to jump into this next game against Marshall because here's how the Sunbelt standings stack up we're tied for second place right now we gotta win this game and we need a little bit of help from Appalachian State as well if we want to see what that Sunbelt championship game what that could potentially be all about so with that being said Let's go ahead and dive into this Marshall matchup, and let's see if we can come out on top. So going on that two-game losing streak is certainly going to hurt us tremendously. But with that being said, we are still in it for the Sun Belt title game. We just got to lock in here for this last month of the season. And Joseph gets the scoring started for us as we are able to execute that read option to perfection. We find the end zone, and that's going to be a touchdown for your Monarchs to get this game started. Love to see that the first drive of the game does end in a score for us, but early in the second quarter, Marshall is going to score with a touchdown of their own. Marshall will quickly take the lead with Claret. And now we find ourselves all knotted up briefly. Marshall does get another score off screen though. So 14 to seven years are scoring. Oh my goodness, look at the speed by Mike McSorley. That man was flying as soon as he made that catch. That is our third string running back. This is a guy that does not have much playing time at all. And he gets his opportunity. He gets on the field and makes an immediate impact. Does go ahead and uh, help us tie this game up. And eventually we take the lead with a chance to go out here and shut the door. We, got, we just got to lock in here for this last few minutes of this game as we look for a perfect play for us to call. And I already know what I want to do. I want to go with a, with a quick pass because I already know Marshall is expecting us to run this ball. So let's see if we can get it here with the stick concept. As Joseph is looking around, he snaps it with two seconds left. And sure enough, Joseph's going to scramble. Nobody reading the quarterback. No spies, we're going to be just fine. Joseph finds the end zone again, and that's a touchdown for the Monarchs. That should be enough to shut the door on Marshall here, and it looks like it is. We got the ball again here, less than two minutes left. This should seal it as Marshall is going to take their final timeout, but we have some other plans here. We kind of want to go crazy. We want to try to run the score up. And uh, it wouldn't be a John Jay gaming game if it wasn't for the fact that we threw an interception. Uh, like I said, man, but thankfully it doesn't hurt us. Uh, we are able to still win anyways. 24 to 20 ends up being your final score. And so 7 and 2. We're having a great season here at 7 and 2 with Verkai James being player of the game. Now, this was a gritty performance for our team because Colton Joseph did have the best of games necessarily 127 yards a touchdown and two interceptions but it was more of that team effort and more specifically Murkai James was certified that man 
25 carries, 225 yards. Did find the end zone though, which does kind of suck, but hey, he's really shown that he's an, an effective running back. We also have Colton Joseph, who found the end zone two separate times on the ground. As for our receivers, it was a tough day at the office, but George Aragon led the team today with three catches and 31 yards. Defensively, though, we had multiple guys with the same number of tackles. Jordan Holmes, Patrick Smith-Young, Derek Goodman, and Jed Aute Judah are all guys with four solo tackles. That does tie for the lead. I don't think, once again, we won that turnover battle, so that's something that we gotta fix as a squad. But once again, we too come away with the win. And for me, that's the most important thing of all. Now, because we already have a couple of losses and we're not very well, the Sun Belt is not very much respected. I don't see us getting to the college football playoff at this point, especially if we don't, uh, especially if we're not even ranked at this point in the year. That being said, though, we did beat Texas. And we're still very much in the hunt here for the Sun Belt. However, we do need some help from Appalachian State. They need to drop their next couple of games. And not only do we need to lose their next couple of games, we got to go out here. We got to win our next couple of games as well. So with that being said, we're going to hop into this Georgia Southern matchup, even though I would prefer to jump into the South Alabama game, just because... With that being said, if we lose the Georgia Southern game, then what's going to happen in our final senior day event is not going to even matter in the grand scheme of things in terms of the goals that we laid out. So we'll leave those worries about Appalachian State behind for a split second as we're just going to focus in on what we need to do ourselves. And that is beat Georgia Southern because if we don't handle our business against Georgia Southern as a favorite then we are going to have uh it doesn't matter what appalachian state does we're gonna lose this game uh we're not gonna be a sunbelt contender anyways so we gotta lock in here and so far so good on the first drive of the game murakai jones uh is feeling himself he's already hot and in the zone so you already know we're gonna continue to ride this run game i mean if it's not broke why try to fix or change anything the quarterback pitches it out to Mike McSorley, who subs into the game. And Mike McSorley uses his speed to take an early 7-0 lead. However, even though Mike McSorley had the touchdown on that last drive, we were still able to go and get some things to shake uh, with Murakai and James. He's still in the zone. And with Cor Corwin Joseph uh, going to work there, and Mike McSorley able to capitalize on those speed option opportunities we find ourselves off to an extremely fast start here as we'll find the end zone for a touchdown as now we're officially going to be up 14 to nothing however with two minutes left here in the first half we have a chance to make it 21 to nothing as we try to throw a quick out to the receiver and his feet were just barely over the goal line George Aragon is going to find the end zone there too. Just simply staring down the crowd, trying to hype everybody up. And we're having an absolutely fun time here in the first half, especially when we get a touchdown like that. Let's go, Monarchs. A 28 to nothing lead. And we are just absolutely on fire offensively. And we take that momentum and we cruise into a victory. While Georgia Southern got 21 unanswered that last touchdown happened in the final moment of the game and it was never in doubt over here so we were able to string together our ninth win of the season and for the once we actually also didn't throw an interception Cole Jolson went 16 for 22 106 free yards and two touchdown passes so you love to see that on the ground game, Murakai James didn't do as much as what he did in the last couple of games, but was still able to get 100 yards on the day while his backup, Mike Missouri, was able to find the end zone on multiple occasions. As for the receivers, again, you know, no one that had that big day necessarily, but Quan Dunbar did lead the team in both catches and yards today. However, it was Murakai James able to find the end zone. He's a sophomore from Delaware. And George Aragon, the Hampton, Georgia product, was able to find the end zone as well. 
Defensively, I thought we played better in the first half than what we saw in the second half, but we did end up playing well enough to win, and that's what matters. Ryan Ramsey, Jordan Holmes, Jen Urujuda, Steven Scott, and Jalen White McLean all had at least three solo tackles on the day today. That was tied for the lead, but again, really struggled with that turnovers. We did at least get one today from Gage Sawyers, though he did hurt himself in the process of doing it. We didn't recover that fumble as well, so that's multiple games that we played now when we weren't able to go ahead and try and get a, uh, you know, get a turnover. So still got to work on that. So for the first time in this rebuild, we do get ranked. We're going to be ranked number 22 in the country. The problem is Appalachian State also won their game against Coastal Carolina. They did it in a shootout. And this is why it's that big of a deal. Even though we are one of the best group of five teams in the country, although UAB, I think, has that inside track uh, to get the group of five bid, the problem is for us, we lost to Appalachian State earlier in the season. And so even though we're probably at least the second best team in the Sun Belt, because of those divisions being there, which is unique to this conference, we're going to be shut out. So App State is automatically going to get in. So we're going to go ahead and sim to probably the bowl game because I do want to see if we can at least make it to 10 wins. So while we weren't able to win against South Alabama, so that does mean that we're going to be out of the top 25. Well, however, what we do get to experience is we do get a four-year contract extension. And because of that, we're going to be staying around a little bit longer. But let's see if we can go out here. Let's see what our bowl game is. And let's see if we can win said bowl game so that we can get to that illustrious 10-year mark. So our efforts for this season is going to take us to the first responder bowl. And we should have a good matchup on our hands taking on a Tulsa Golden Hurricane squad that is currently in the top 25. So I imagine if we win this game, we could finish in that top 25 poll as well. Let's see if we can actually pull it off. So while we didn't get that, that Sunbelt Championship game appearance like we won, we still have an opportunity to make this a 10-win season. Let's see if we can make it happen here in the first responder bowl. If we could pull the upset off, we probably would finish the season ranked in the top 25 as well. So even though we fell short of our expectations, that's even with winning our non-conference games. Like, imagine that. Like, we we can beat Virginia Tech and we could beat um we could beat Texas. We beat both of those teams, and yet we're still not here uh like in the playoff. It it happens to the best of us, unfortunately, but we're all to a good start here. We ran it in for a touchdown. Take a 7-0 lead as we try to get a deep ball downfield. Oh, my goodness. He's wide butt naked open, and he's on his feet, too. Touchdown, Old Dominion. And the Monarchs are rolling here early. There is no loss of motivation here in this bowl game. We came to play, and we certainly came out here absolutely motivated to play. 14-0, still your score, though, as we try to get another good drive downfield. Oh, he's open again. Oh, he's open again. Oh, he can't stay on his feet this time. I almost overthrew him, but we get down by the goal line, and you already know I'm trying to punch that joint in. 14-0. Oh, we're going to run it in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Touchdown, Monarchs. Let's go, baby. You love to see it, man. 21 to nothing and we get it rolling here late we handle business in that first responder bowl and there it is guys we get our first 10 win season here in this rebuild and we're playing better too as a user so while our offense did end up stalling in the second half i'm proud that we were able to find a way to win 10 games throughout the season Colton Joseph led the way for us here, man. 192 touchdown. Honestly, should have had a second touchdown if the receiver was able to stay on his feet because we were really gushing them in the second half, or in the first half, I should say. Did get a touchdown from Murkai James, even though he did not have 100 yards, but he does have over 1,200 yards on this season. Colton Joseph also finds a rushing touchdown as well. TJ Watt had a breakout performance here in the bowl game. 
four catches, but 132 yards as well. He hurt his defense in a worst of ways. Longest catch of the day did end up going for 69 yards, which we all agree is very nice. Now, defensively, we didn't play as well in the second half, but it was overall a good day for our defense. Steven Scott is going to go ahead and pick up six solo tackles and actually led the team by a country mile. We're excited to see him back for his senior year. Could possibly be an NFL caliber player for sure. I don't see any turnovers forced in this game, though. Although, hang on now. No, we don't get any fumbles. Ashton Waite Whitener, the senior, playing in his final game from Greenville, South Carolina. He does end up getting a forced fumble, but with that being said, again, didn't force a turnover. Hopefully, we can do better as a defense next season, but we did reach that illustrious 10 win mark. So, not only do we end up finishing with that 10 win season and we finish ranked in the top 25, we do also increase our team prestige tremendously we go from being a one-star program to now being a two-star program and a lot of that is because of our coach prestige and our coach stability as well so that should really help us out with off-season recruiting when that time comes but we do have a couple of people that are attempting to leave the transfer portal. Quincy Howard is one that I really want to try and keep. And we have a decent chance of getting him to stay. But he can't be persuaded. We'll see if we can at least get Ricky Bromel to stay with us. And he has decided to stay. So at least we are able to keep him around. But we are losing Quincy Howard. Which is going to be quite a hit for our defensive line. That I honestly was not expecting. As for the rest of the team, I mean, we lose a fair number of very good players. Ryan Ramey, Cole Natoya, Ashton Whitner, Martin Wadsman, and Patrick Smith-Young. That's four key starters on our defense, including Quincy Howard that's entering the transfer portal. So we're losing five key starters on defense, and then we're also losing Martin Woodsman, who is one of our better offensive linemen that we had on the team. All right, boys, so we get done with off-season recruiting, and this is the class that we end up signing. Now, our high school recruiting was not great because we did start off as a one-star school, so it was difficult for us to get anything more than a two-star prospect, but we did get a handful of three stars uh, later on in the process, uh, mostly offensive linemen. I am particularly excited about Neil Kane, who we discovered was a gem, so that's going to be exciting. He's going to be essentially like a four-star player in the state of Virginia. We also sign a couple more athletes as well. But that being said, though, oh, baby, did we go crazy in that transfer portal, though. Oh, my goodness. Look at the number of free stars that we brought into the program. Guys that are going to be able to contribute to our team right away. And it's going to propel us to have one of the best recruiting classes in the entirety of the Sun Belt. So it's going to be Sun Belt or Bust for us when that season number four comes around. We do not end up signing the best class in the conference, though. Marshall did sign a little bit better of a class, but we I think we have more quality of player here than Marshall does more guys to work with as well while Marshall did end up signing a couple of four-star players from the high school ranks now with that being said this is what our training results did end up being here and I'm actually surprised that we didn't really improve in overall to be honest with you I thought I would see a little bit move more movement on this front However, that being said, I do truly believe our top end talent is going to be more prevalent than what it was last year. So maybe the depth that we have at a couple of positions just isn't fully there. But you see the number of 80 plus overall guys that are on this team. I think even though we may not have the, the same overall as last year, we actually might be a little bit worse. I still think we are going to be an absolute problem in the Sun Belt, and I think we can certainly make some things happen this upcoming season. But because we ended up bringing in 35 guys this season, that being said, we are going to have to have almost 20 people be encouraged to enter the transfer portal, which is absolutely insane. 
and a lot and we can't say goodbye to these true freshmen that we brought in either so that was something that you know i didn't really think about fully uh, for, uh in terms of bringing in that caliber of player wish i can get rid of some of these one stars i'll be able to do this next season but yeah let me go ahead and do that real quick and then i'll show you the final 85 man roster all right so that was an absolute pain to do but with that being said though because we were able to trim some uh some fat off the bone we were able to actually improve our overall so our overall is actually roughly the same from last year but again i think we're going to be a better team overall even though the the rating is essentially the same just primarily because i think our top end talent is actually going to be better so as long as we can remain healthy i think we're going to be absolutely dangerous this upcoming season so this is what our schedule is going to look like for the upcoming season uh, here in year number four. We are switching things up a little bit. We are taking on SMU at home, and then Virginia Tech is going to come to our stadium as well. After that, we'll wrap up non-conference play, taking on UConn, who you know we had that home and home with, and uh, we'll take on the Riverside Royals uh, from the FCS ranks as well, so we're excited about that opportunity. Then we jump into conference play here and we should have a pretty navigatable schedule overall two key games that i am certainly looking at is at south alabama and that appalachian state game if we can win both of those games i think we have a real shot of being sunbelt champions this upcoming season so a season full of expectations we might have some first game nerves here as our offense hasn't really been able to do anything all day long but we might have something shaking here on a third and short as I'm going to put Blind Trust into my receiver winning the slant. And he's not going to do it. He is not going to win that slant pattern at all. And we're going to have this taken to the crib against us. Marquis Grant is going to have a pick six thrown against us. And offensively, we just never had any kind of rhythm going in this game. We lose 14 to 6. And a lot of those expectations that we originally have. They might be going down the drain quickly if we don't readjust ourselves extre extremely fast. So our first game does not end how we want it to end. And so that puts our college football playoff aspirations in immediate, uh, in immediate jeopardy. Now, we had a good first drive, but beyond that, we really didn't do anything offensively. That pick six definitely hurt us, but... That was not the only thing that hurt us in this game, even though we did manage to find a way to go out there and play pretty good defensively. Another thing that happened for us here was that we missed a couple of kicks as well. So between the couple of kicks and that pick six that we had, while it would have been ugly, we should have absolutely won this game. But unfortunately, it was just not meant to be. Now, with that being said, our aspirations are going to be down the toilet in terms of a playoff appearance here in year number four, right? Because I'm not mad about losing this Virginia Tech team. Virginia Tech is a solid program. They're a good football team over there. What I am upset about is in simulation, we find a way to lose to an FCS team. That's something that simply cannot happen. So we're starting this season off one and three. We're limping into Sunbelt action in our first Sunbelt conference game here is going to be up against Southern Miss. Now, Southern Miss hasn't lost a single game yet this season. We thought that we won't have to worry about South Alabama and maybe Appalachian State, but Southern Miss is coming with bad intentions. But let's see if we can play a little bit spoiler here to see if we can take some of their momentum away. So even though our college football playoff chances are effectively down the drain, we can still make some noise in the Sun Belt. We just got to go and focus up here in the Sun Belt opener as we have a chance to take a 7-0 lead here early as we're going to go on a first and goal in the two-yard line. Going to try to set the pitch out to the corner. And there is Devin Roche able to find the end zone. Touchdown, Monarchs! And we will take the lead against undefeated Southern Miss. Let's go, baby. That's what I'm talking about, man. Let's go. So up seven to nothing here already as they're gonna throw to the left-hand side and Southern Miss is gonna try and tie this thing up. As now, third and short as their tailback. Oh, he's gonna get loose with it. Nearly finds the end zone. I get a big hit on him, but 
it does not lead to any fumble or anything like that. I would have loved to have uh, been able to do just that. As now, 7 to nothing is your score. They're trying to throw over the middle. It's caught. Touchdown, Southern Miss. And the Southern Miss Eagles are going to nod things up here at 7 apiece. And we got ourselves a ball game on our hands. So two minutes left as I try to throw a quick ball out to a receiver. And the corner jumps that one out as well. Trying to take advantage of maybe those mismatches. But it's been backfiring honestly pretty horribly to be honest with you. We are not doing uh, ourselves any kind of favors. But at least we'll answer back with a touchdown of our own. So we are able to bounce back like a Big Sean uh, rap song. And we're going to tie things up here at 14 apiece. Now, with that being said, in the fourth quarter, we actually do have a lead going into the final quarter. We got to finish the game, though. And this is not what I'm talking about finishing. Southern Miss trying to finish us off. No ditty. And sure enough, they will. As they will find the end zone here for the touchdown. We are going to be all knotted up here at 21 apiece. And we got a battle on our hands. Southern Miss, Old Dominion, and a fight here late in the fourth quarter. We got a chance to win it, and what are we doing? So the first two interceptions, absolutely my fault. That one was not, and here's why. So I was thinking that he was going to go on a go route, and that was one of the choices that he can go. He had his defender on his hip. We had him on the go route. He decides to cut in anyways. And that hurt. That's the difference between an interception and a touchdown right there. So now it's 28 to 21. I'm just trying to make anything happen at this point. Got to stay in the pocket. And we do not do that. We do not go ahead and not escape that pocket. Southern Miss is able to run out the clock. And we are going to lose a heartbreaker. And that also means we are going to drop our opener here in Sunbelt action. Hoping for better days ahead of us. So our team gave it everything that we had, but unfortunately we're going to fall short here as we just had a hard time finding any consistency in our passing game. Colin Joseph struggled particularly in that fourth quarter, throwing two interceptions as he was a little bit uh, on a different track than what he was tracking to uh, with his receiver. Devin Roche had a good game though. He had 84 yards and a touchdown. And then also have George Aragon finding the end zone for us, as did Quan Dunbar. Now, defensively, I thought we played fine defensively. We really screwed ourselves over with some pick sixes while trying to be aggressive downfield. Steven Scott and Tyquan Bullard are going to combine with 12 solo tackles between the two. We even had a nice interception from the senior Zion Frank. Zion Frank was able to take that uh, pretty far, like a 36-yarder. But unfortunately, because we end up losing that turnover battle, including two turnovers in our final couple of possessions, that is going to hurt us tremendously, and it absolutely did. And the nightmare season actually continues for us because after that Southern Miss game, we end up dropping a couple more games by a combined seven points. So it's been that type of year. We barely lose to Georgia Southern, and then we barely lose to our rivals in James Madison. So in a year in which that had so much hope and so many expectations for us coming in, now we have to win out just to go to a bowl game. So we're going to jump into this South Alabama game. If we win, you know, we'll continue with our same kind of battle rhythm. But if not, then we're just going to go ahead and simulate to the end of the season. So here we are with a must win against South Alabama. And South Alabama is having a very good season themselves. They might be one of the favorites to go to the Sun Belt title game. So we might have our hands full in this particular matchup. And I don't know what it is with this team, but we just do not have nearly the same level of focus that we had from last season. I mean, the overall of our team is literally the same as last year. So I don't know how we're so much worse than what we are. It's absolutely baffling to me. And a lot of those mistakes that we made early on in the rebuild, they're rearing their ugly head right about now as we just simply cannot get out of our own way here. We're down 14 to nothing here. 
but we might have a little bit of a drive here. Let's see if we can at least finish this drive strong as I want to get to the tailback here. Trying to throw it early and get to the corner, but I might have thrown that pass a little bit too early as I'm going to throw yet another interception. And the wheels absolutely fell off there in the second half and beyond. We lose big 42 to 14 in a year that it had so much expectations for us. We're not even going to be bowl eligible, which is crazy. Now, the end of the season does give me some positive signs of encouragement going into the offseason. And that's because we do win at least two of our last four games. While we lose to an Appalachian State team that does get ranked here towards the end of the regular season, we do find a way to dominate against Georgia State. And then we were also able to find a way to pull the upset off against Coastal Carolina, who was in the running to compete for a legitimate Sun Belt Championship. But this was a rough year all around for the squad, and we're gonna hope that Quinn Heinegel, who we brought in through the transfer portal last year, hopefully he becomes our guy moving forward because Colin Joseph, he had a rough year, man. 17 touchdowns, 17 interceptions. I ex expected so much better from our senior star quarterback. However, Devin Roche was able to go ahead and put together a healthy season for once and he was okay he was one of those players that never really lived up to his potential at the end of the day injuries really did hurt him however Murakai James showed that he might be the more effective back going forward and should be expected to have that full-time role next season as for our receivers our receivers continue to try and grow but this time we had TJ Lott as our leading receiver Watt was able to garner five, 54 catches for 691 yards and five touchdowns. We also saw early Newsom find the end zone quite a few times. Alongside guys like George Aragon, which I think is an awesome last name, by the way. Devin Roche and the tight end, Quan Dunbar. And of course, taking a look at our defense, how our uh, highlights for our defense, uh, Darren. Goodman did lead the team in tackles this year. He had 72 total tackles on the year, and he was our leading tackler, hopefully to come back in his junior campaign. He also, we, well, we also saw, and I think another reason why we struggled this season was, I think we just had too many notable losses on defense this year. It showed when we did have the same productivity in terms of sacking the quarterback, Ahmad Foster was our lead sack garnerer, and he didn't even reach five sacks this year. But that's not to say we didn't have bright spots on this team, as Tommy Talib continues to show that he's a certified baller. The Woodbury Forest product was able to be the only player on the team that had multiple interceptions this season. And then checking out Forest Fumbles, well, we did force quite a few fumble recoveries. Mod Foster and Jalen Page were able to have multiple forced fumbles this year. Matter of fact, Jalen Page, who did end up getting hurt, so he didn't play a full season, he actually led the team in fumble recoveries. He had four of those joints alongside Ahmad Foster, Tommy Talid, and Steven Scott, who were also able to fall into the ball multiple times this season. So I think this comes with very little surprise, actually. Um, we have an absolute just exodus from the transfer portal. I mean, look at all these people trying to leave the program, man. That's what you do when you bring in guys that have this mentality of either playing for the coach or either they're trying to play for a championship and then you have just a just downturn of a year like we just witnessed. So we're not gonna be able to keep all of these guys anyway. So let's see if we can do our best just to try and bring in as many of these guys as possible. Starting with some of these like maybe medium slay guys. I only have six persuasions here. I do get a key hatch to stay. So at least there's that. So that's a key offensive lineman that we get to keep in the portal. I also wanna try and keep Tyron Kimball. He's not gonna be persuaded. But, we'll all, but we will, however, try to persuade Simon Doosable. He's a 69 overall as a freshman. He's not persuaded either. So, obviously, we're off to a very good start here. I still got three persuasions that I want to use. Definitely want to use it on Jed Aluda Judah. And Jed Aluda Judah does decide to save. That's a big stay there. Able to keep him from entering the transfer portal. Makura James, on the other hand... 
he is actually going to be our starting running back next season. But we are going to need another starting running back as well. He's leaving the transfer portal. And so that leaves us with just one more. We got Tommy Castillo, a center, trying to keep that key offensive lineman. He does at least stay. So we get to keep some of the guys that we want to go after. But with that being said, ah, uh, man, that was, uh, that was a tough pill to swallow, man. Also had some good players uh, leave, leave through graduation as well. So we're going to have to figure out how to replace some of these guys too. But hopefully we can, you know, make some moves in the transfer portal uh, because I think we're certainly going to need it. Lost several key pieces, in my opinion. But one thing that is going to become abundantly clear is that when we step out there on that football field, we're going to come out here with some bad intentions. We do end up signing the top class in the Sun Belt. We signed 28 total players including a couple of players from the transfer portal, but this time around, we were mostly high school reliant, but have a fair share of free stars, which I'm pretty happy to bring in, and we also signed a class that's in the top half of America. So this is going to be our team going into year number five and the final year of this rebuild. We do have 190 overall on this team. That is Ahmad Foster. Mod Foster is going to be our best player on our team, and it is going to be a uh, going to be an NFL prospect for us here. So hopefully that will help with the NFL grade. We are slightly better than where we were last year. I think last year we were like just under 80 overall. This time we're at an 81 overall, but I'm liking the level of talent that I have for the starters. The problem is I don't necessarily have a uh, a guy that's going to necessarily be a star for us on the offensive side of the ball and i'm hoping that mike mcsorley can play higher than his overall states because he, i was expecting him to be my backup now he's going to take a full-time role with the danny doyle expect to get a significant number of work what will be nice about this year as well is that we actually um, will have a lot less mayhem with our roster. So we're only going to need a few people to enter the transfer portal. And I think what I'm going to go ahead and do and get some of these lower rated players that we brought in last year. We're just going to let them, well, well, Danny, if Danny Doyle wasn't going to be my backup tailback, well, hang on. He actually, where does he stand? Oh, yeah, Danny Doyle's not going to be a starter. John Cabrera's going to be a starter. Yeah, I feel okay with getting Danny Doyle up out of there. If I ever do that, then get rid of a freshman red shirt. He'll have more eligibility to work with. So, this is going to be our final roster here as we prepare to embark on year number five. All right, so here is our updated roster, or at least our updated schedule, I should say, going into year number five. Now, we should have a pretty relatively easy non-conference schedule. We're taking on Virginia first in the opener. This is the first time we're playing Virginia, actually. We also have, like, FCS Midwest, San Diego State, who didn't make a bowl game, and then Virginia Tech, that wasn't even above 500 last year. So, that's what we got going into for non-conference season. So, be pretty navigatable. Notable games in conference play do include a Coastal Carolina, Appalachian State, who won eight games last year, Southern Miss, who actually started the year 5-0, and but they uh, kind of fell apart in the last half of the season. And then here's the rest of our schedule. Um, this is a navigatable schedule, and I think we do have a better team than last year. We just got to go ahead and execute. So I'm not worried about this Virginia, FCS, or San Diego State game. I might come back to you either for this Virginia Tech game or if it's clear that we're not going to accomplish anything, I'm going to simulate right to the end of the season because I'm not worried about recruiting in this final year of the rebuild challenge. All right, so already the Sim Gods are not in our favor as we lose to Virginia by a few points. And then we also lose to San Diego State by a touchdown as well. So now we're looking at this Virginia Tech game up next. Key point in the season. Let's see if we can go to Blacksburn and pull off the upset and use this as an opportunity to get a nice little tune-up in before we get in the Sunbelt Conference action for the final time in this rebuild. So you're probably wondering why I'm showing punts, and that means that something's about to go down here as Virginia Tech's going to try to return a punt. It's a nice return, but we fall on the football, and we are going to recover. 
So that's going to take us almost to the 20-yard line. Basically a red zone opportunity right off the bat. We got to capitalize. We get a play action here, and we're able to get behind the defense. It's caught, but not for a touchdown. Oh, if I threw it just a little bit better, that could have been a touchdown pass for our quarterback, Quinn Heineke, who is the transfer from UAB, and Mike McSorley, who is our new, new tailback that's starting, made those big plays for us back in year number three. Mike McSorley finds the end zone, and just like that, we got a 7-0 lead here against Virginia Tech. Meanwhile, the Hokies are trying to get something rolling here themselves, and they will answer back with a touchdown of their own, and they will nod things up here against the Virginia Tech Hokies as we got a 7-all game here between us and Virginia Tech. As now, 14-7 is your score as they're trying to go ahead and trying to step up in the pocket. But we get hit from behind, and Quinn Heineckel does not protect the ball. And so because of that, that means that we are now trying to get a stop here on defense, and we will! Intercepted! And our defense holds it down! We might have some special sauce here in this game. Pulling an upset off on Virginia Tech. That would be a massive accomplishment as we've been close a handful of times, at least in the gameplay, but we have not been able to do uh, have any such luck like in the uh, like actual gameplay. So we have a chance to extend the lead before we go into halftime. That's a nice little run there by uh, Quinn Heinekel. We got a couple of plays left here, though, as we get it out to our receiver who gets out of bounds, so we're able to save our timeouts even more. Still got a couple of timeouts to work with as Quinn Heinekel already with over a 1,000 passing yards on the year. Let's see if we can add on that for him as we try to throw this ball deep downfield. Want to try to send it deep, and it's intercepted. And we have a broken tackle there, a miss there. And we were just trying to send it deep before the end of the half, almost like a Hail Mary. And it backfires horribly. Touchdown for Virginia Tech. And we're going to time this game before the half. And that was absolutely the last thing that we needed before going into the locker room. Now, with three minutes left in the game, Virginia Tech is up by six. We have a chance to at least come out and win this game. Let's see if we can do just that. As we're going to run it with Mike McSorley, who's all by himself. He's in open field. Gets a little juke move to get away from the safety. But people do catch up to him as now we have a chance to take the lead and we will touchdown monarchs and old dominion takes the lead on virginia tech now we just need our defense to come out here and stand tall that's all we need so 28 to 27 now your score as virginia tech looks to get down to business they don't need a massive drive they just need to get themselves down into field goal range just gotta find a way to stop Delvey Bedford who is a senior quarterback has been behind Kenron Jones for quite some time now has his opportunity and making the most of his opportunity to be honest he's having a nice season for Virginia Tech as they continue to drive down the length of the field and I give up the corner route touchdown Hokies and just like that we are gonna be down once again we're going to be down quite a bit here, down by five. But with that being said, the Hokies were successful with the two-point conversion. So I got to throw this up. Last play of the game, hoping for the best. It's caught! It's caught! Touchdown, Monarchs! But there's a penalty. It's on the defense, though, so we're good. And not only that, we are able to have a chance to win in overtime, but I don't get the pitch off. Oh, we couldn't get that pitch off. We were able to get that pitch off to Mike McSorley. We were go we had a first down. We possibly could have won the game. But unfortunately, we folded in overtime. And Virginia Tech is going to survive. But we certainly did our due diligence in giving them a scare. But even though we ended up losing this game, it was a spirited comeback by our Monarchs, led by Quinn Heinekel. The UAB transfer ended up throwing for three touchdowns, as well as over 250 yards in the game. Not only that, but he also managed to contribute on the ground as well with a handful of yards. 
Mike Masor, he looked really good as well. 20 for 180, a couple of touchdowns on the ground as well. Now, as for the receivers, Titus Paris actually nearly had 100 yards today and did end up catching a touchdown in this one. But Ricky Bromel was the physical threat and he caught that Hail Mary touchdown that did actually sent us to overtime, even though he fell short. He made some really big plays out there, including a one that went for a long of 75 yards. However, it was the defense that ended up selling us here today as we give up 38 points in this one. Did have a couple of bright spots, so in Cortland Soller and Marquan Lanovoy, both of those guys had nearly double-digit tackles. Soller certainly did there. Derek Goodman ended up with a couple of sacks, and then we had a couple of interceptions too, Tyquan Bullard and Marquan Lanovoy. Uh, so we actually did end up being pretty even on the turnover battle. Matter of fact, we won it. It just wasn't our day today, as Jerome Carter did also end up with multiple fumble recoveries over the course of the game. Now, after that game against Virginia Tech, we do end up losing pretty convincingly to Georgia State to start Sunbelt Conference play. However, we are able to bounce back, beating Coastal Carolina 26-21. So it puts us up against Appalachian State, who has typically been towards the top of the Sun Belt, at least in our division. If we can handle business against Appalachian State, then I think we could set ourselves up to maybe make a decent little run here in the Sun Belt. That is still an attainable goal for our team. So the college football playoff is probably out of the question now, but we can still make some noise in the Sun Belt. It starts with Appalachian State, who back in your number three, these were the guys that were solely responsible from keeping us out of the Sun Belt Championship back in your number three, and I'm looking for some revenge. This is a great start to it as we break one tackle. Couldn't get a, a second man to miss. But that was a nice little play to get things started. As we go back to Mike McSorley, able to make a man miss, gets hit on the inside. And now inside the five yard line, we're going to shut the door. Heinekel looks over the middle. He's got a slant open and he gets it there. Touchdown, Monarchs. And Old Dominion is going to take the lead against Appalachian State in one of the toughest group of five environments in college football. And not only will we take a 7-0 lead, we're going to quickly make it 14-0 as we get the scissors concept to work to absolute perfection. Ain't nobody was guarding this man, and we're going to officially be up 14-0. However, in the third quarter, Heinekel's going to step up. He wants a rushing touchdown to go with it, and he'll get it there. Quinn Heinekel. Flexing on the App State defender for a, for a quick second before saluting the App State crowd. Just absolutely cold-hearted there. Up 24 to nothing here. And this should seal it. A big play by our defense. Able to get an interception when Appalachian State was just simply trying to go for it. And we were able to dominate in this game. We roll to a 37-7 victory. Getting some revenge from App State back in your number three and rewriting some demons that we have been facing for quite some time. So a blowout victory led by our transfer quarterback, Quinn Heinekel. Quinn Heinekel ends up going down 197 yards, three touchdown passes, just the one interception though. Uh, very clean game overall. Mike Missouri also continuing to prove his valor as well. He had at almost six yards to carry in this game, but it was Quinn Heinekel and his backup running back, John Cabrera, who were able to find the end zone on the ground. For the receivers, Ricky Bromel. Ricky Bromel was able to have two separate receiving touchdowns. He was really torching that Appalachian State defense today. Sean Ware was also able to find the end zone off of a nice little corner route. Uh, nice job there by the freshman from Miami. Now, I was hoping for the shutout, but we don't quite get it here. But it was still a great day for our defense. Corwin Soler was a nice leader up the middle as he led the team in solo tackles with seven total tackles. We also forced some turnovers too. Taron Stingley, who didn't have a single solo tackle today, he was able to get the only interception uh, force on the day. Tyquan Bullard was able to 
force a fumble as well, but it was not recovered. Again, a great day for our team, and maybe that Sun Belt is still in play after all. And this could truly be our year in which maybe we can make that Sun Belt happen. We took on Texas State, who was having a good season and was getting top 25 consideration. We beat them 32 to 30, being your final score at home. And now we have a key game against Southern Miss, where we're looking to avenge our loss that we had from last season. So let's see if we can continue the dream season as we go ahead and get things started here against Southern Miss. And right, we get to a good start. First play of the game uh, ends up being an 11 yard run for Mike McSorley. Now I want to see if we can attack downfield here as Heinekel is going to set up a play action. Thought we might have X open here, but we cannot win on the route. And it ends up being intercepted. Might need to be one of those things where we need to tune down the interceptions a little bit because we are playing on base sliders. I will say that uh, it does seem like the defenders are doing a little too good of a job of actually uh, making some interceptions happen. But we will make up for it on the next drive. We will get a touchdown in the end zone as our receiver was able to win on the go pattern as Old Dominion is going to go on and win 20-17 being your final score. So we're able, even though it wasn't our A game, we did enough to win. And that's all that matters sometimes in college football. Just got to survive in advance in weeks like this where we don't have our fastball. So while Quinn Heinekel did get to a slow start in this one, he showed a lot of grit in this game. Ended up gutting out over 200 yards passing and a couple of passing touchdowns to go with that as well. In addition, on the ground, we also didn't get our typical production. As Southern Miss did a great job of containing our rush, we averaged less than three yards of carry in this game. But Ricky Bromel got crazy out there on the perimeter. He had a long of 85 yards. He had a long touchdown there. And then George Aragon was also able to garner a 51-yard touchdown strike himself. Defensively though, I thought we played pretty well overall as three separate guys had seven total tackles. Those guys were Terrence Stingley, Jen Aluda Judah, and Jerome Carter as well, who both all had seven tackles. We did also get an interception from the Katy Texas product as well to help even up that turnover battle. But Jalen Page was just a defensive lineman that was absolutely all over this field. He had multiple fumble recoveries today, and it allowed us to win the turnover battle and therefore win the game. Now, alongside our win that we were able to get against Georgia Southern as well, we now improve to 5-1 in conference play, and effectively, we control our own destiny. We did already beat Appalachian State in the regular season, but that Marshall team, that Marshall team is the next game that's going to be on deck. And if we win this game, we would go to the Sun Belt Championship and likely host the Sun Belt Championship because I don't believe they have a neutral site. I believe it goes to the team that has the best conference record. So big opportunity for us to not only go to the conference championship game, but to also host that joint as well. So let's see if we can win this game and get ourselves out to the Sun Belt Championship game as we start things off of a run here for the Marshall tailback down the sideline and finding the end zone for the Thundering Herd is his tailback number 20. Marshall is going to score and they will tie things up here early in the second quarter. However, we have a chance ourselves to go and pull away here as we do get a touchdown off screen. Mike McSorry is still on his feet, but I get stuck. Um, could have been a much bigger game than what it actually was, but all good though. We'll get to the line quickly here as Heinkel is going to take a look at the line of scrimmage. I got X wide open over the middle, and he's got speed. Can he make one more guy miss? No, he decides to get out of bounds instead, protect the body, and later on in the drive, we'll finish it up with a slant right there. Threw it just behind the receiver. Beautiful spot there. And that's going to be another touchdown for your old Dominion squad, man. Up 21 to 7 as Heinegel finds the end zone one more time. That's another touchdown. We're quickly pulling away from Marshall. And the Thundering Herd simply cannot handle us here in a must-win Sunbelt title game. 
and there it is basically a semi-finals to sunbelt championship and we win it 28 to 13 the only question now is who's going to be our opponent when we see uh, them on the other side Quinn Heineke once again did throw a couple of interceptions but also had a couple of nice touchdown throws looked pretty cool and calm and collected when he was down there in the red zone for sure in addition to the ground game uh, Mike McSorley had an okay game today he ended up with 25 carries for 94 yards but again it's Quinn Heineke coming in getting a couple of rushing touchdowns even though he is a field general he's more of a pocket passer type he is going to have that quite efficiency to work through too as for the receivers today not a lot of different people touched the ball but Ricky Gromel he was clearly the top target in the red zone catching both touchdown passes from Quinn Heineke and finally the defense played extremely well today as Tyquan Bullard led the team in tackles today with ace doing so from that corner position did however not force any turnovers to my knowledge although Jalen Page tried to change that with a forced fumble just didn't happen for us but we will be going to the Sunbelt Championship game the only question now is who are we going up against now we did end up winning our regular season finale against James Madison so we finished the Sunbelt action 7-1 which gives us the opportunity to host here on our home turf for the Sunbelt Championship we've actually have made that happen you'll love to see it this was a team that i believe we did play in the regular season granted it's not a team that we actually played in gameplay and this was a team that actually we were very competitive with 32 to 30 was the final score but listen playing against a good texas state squad it's hard to beat a good team twice and that's exactly what we are going to need to do here if we want to come out on top however we are coming in riding a seven game winning streak but let's see if we can finish this sun uh, old dominion rebuild on a high note let's see if we can win that sun belt championship game all right boys so we're working towards five years of this rebuild two hours of of gameplay on this video and it all comes down to this the Sun Belt title game while we probably won't make the playoff let's see if we can accomplish one of our goals in our rebuild and so far Texas State is going to make it difficult to accomplish that even though we are on our home turf Texas State will end up drawing first blood as they will go ahead and take a 7-0 lead but the Monarchs can uh, continue to uh, be one of those teams that ended up handling their business. You know, they grinded it out, and eventually we had a chance to win the game with less than two minutes left. We got the first down that we were looking for, and while we struggled immensely on offense, really could not move the ball, we did win when it mattered the most. As if we clock hits triple zero, and we are going to be champions of the Sun Belt. We win. 17 to 10 it was a little bit of a uh, slugfest but we'll get to hold that sun belt crown at the end now while this was a little bit more of a slugfest we found a way to make those critical plays when it mattered the most as Quinn Heineckel did have our only touchdown of the day through the air as you saw but Mike McSorley also had some big plays himself. He ran for over 100 yards on the ground. We do love to absolutely see that. And then Ricky Bromel, obviously, he had a big day today with five catches over 100 yards and really having a breakout performance as a young sophomore receiver. But the Flowers absolutely had to be provided for this defense. And that was a big reason why we won this game. Allowing 10 points is going to win you a lot of football games at the college level. Jed Aluda Judah did end up leading the team in tackles today. He had six total tackles in this one. We were able to get to this quarterback multiple times as well. However, we did not force any interceptions and also didn't force any fumbles as well. But we did enough in order to make ourselves champions of the Sun Belt. And there it is in year number five. We were able to accomplish one of the two goals that we originally set out to do, being champions of the Sun Belt. That football championship game being presented by Hercules Tires 
We'll see if we can have some Lady Luck on our side and maybe, just maybe see if we can sneak our way into a playoff. But in spite of our performance in the Sun Belt, we did not do enough in order to get to the college football playoff. We had that slow start at the beginning of the season. That really killed us here um, as the last team in was North Texas as champions of the American. We still weren't even ranked in this top 25. But while we weren't invited to go to the college football playoff, we did get invited to go to the Birmingham Bowl. And ironically enough, we took on Virginia Tech, who we played in the regular season. And in simulation, we were able to get our get back as well. So we beat Virginia Tech 10 to 7 in a defensive slugfest. And that means we are champions of the Birmingham Bowl. And for the second time in the last three seasons, we do win 10 games in a single campaign. Checking out the stats for our guys over the course of the season as Quinn Heidekel, the former UAB quarterback, started for us for much of the season. And he was solid, not a liquid or gas in the regard. Quinn Heidekel ended up throwing for 28 touchdowns and 15 interceptions while completing 65% of his bat passes. We did also see a little bit of co-banks as well. In terms of running the ball, though, we almost had ourselves a 100, 1,000 yard rusher as Mike McSorry was just shy of that, falling just 60 yards short, but still had six rushing touchdowns. Quinn Heinekel was the second leading rusher with 319. And then John Cabrera, our freshman tailback, while he didn't carry the ball much and wasn't really effective when he got the football, he did find a way to get a few touchdowns down by the goal line. However, we did accomplish getting a 1,000-yard receiver in Ricky Bromel. Ricky Bromel played much higher than his overall, over 1,000 yards, 15 touchdowns as well. Dude was absolutely, he went crazy, man. He plays a lot better than his 69 overall, which we still think is pretty nice. Also had some help, though. George Aragon had nearly 800 yards, and then Matt Iverson also had nearly close, somewhat close to 800 yards as well, except he only found the end zone once. Also finding the end zone was Rakeem Bynum, Titus Paris, the sophomore tight end, and Sean Ware, who had five catches for 36 yards in his first season on the field. Now, defensively, Cortland Soler, our junior linebacker from Stark, Florida, did lead the team in tackles. He had 72 total tackles on the year. We did also have better sack production as Jalen Page had a breakout campaign. Jalen Page had 11 and a half sacks over the course of the season. And just across the board, we were able to be much more physical defensively than where we were last year because we had so many more guys with f at least five sacks. Derek Goodman, Taven French, Taryn Stingley, Devon Day Ruffin, and Cole Mc McMillan all had at least five sacks. And then for interceptions, our senior quarter, Jed Aludo Judah, he actually led the team with interceptions. He had four uh, such uh, opportunities. Cortland Sower had a few, and then even Terrence Stingley and Marquan Lonavoy also had multiple interceptions as well. For your forced fumbles, Jalen Page led the way with three forced fumbles, but Jed Aluda Judah and Ahmad Foster also had multiple forced fumbles alongside the senior Jerome Carter. And those fumbles were primarily recovered by Jalen Page, Amon Foster, and Jerome Carter. Finally, we didn't have any defensive touchdowns this season, but I can tell that even though we didn't have any defensive scores, we played significantly better than what we did last year. So that's going to wrap things up here in terms of the Old Dominion rebuild. While we weren't successful in getting these guys to the college football playoff, I considered two 10-win seasons in the span of five years and winning a Sun Belt title in one of those five years, I would consider this rebuild an overall success. This took some time in order to record and, and edit down, so I appreciate it of you guys watching this whole thing. If you enjoyed this rebuild, make sure you go ahead, smack that like button, hit that subscribe button as well if you have to be brand new as we'll be doing a lot of EA College football with this game officially being out. Plus, not to mention, down in the comment section, let me know if there's so many other teams out there that you would like me to rebuild in the future. But with that being said, this is John Jay Gaming on the mic signing off. But hoping you guys are all out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.